Hey guys, it's Pinder, another special edition of Barn Burner. This summer, we're unloading a lot of our favorite chats we've recorded with Flames legends, alumni, and well, just some of the best people we know. Not many better than Lanny McDonald, the captain of the cup winning 1989 Stanley Cup Flames, sat down with Rhett Warner and myself. A lot of laughs, a lot of history, and for a small town guy growing up on a farm outside Hannah, it seems like he climbed to the peak of the hockey world, summiting Mount Everest, winning that cup, retiring a champion. A great chat with Lanny McDonald. It was done right here in our Tower Studios. Reminder, Tower Chrysler, your Consumer Choice Award winners. Calgary's favorite Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep dealer. Find them at 10901 McLeod Trail South and at towerchrysler.com. Also, if you're out and about this summer, you see the Nation Jeep, you see the Nation Truck, snap a picture, throw it on social media with the hashtag. Uh, See what Boom and I are up to. Enjoy the sit down with uh, the world's most famous hockey mustache, Lanny McDonald. Well, just a member of Canada's Sports Hall of Fame, the Hockey Hall of Fame. He was awarded the Order of Hockey in Canada in 2022, a player and a manager for our country internationally. Also, two time All Star, the single season goal record holder for the Calgary Flames, and of course, co captain to the 1989. Stanley Cup champion, Calgary Flames. Hall of Famer, Lanny McDonald. What? Wow. Now, wait. The Order of Canada, like you order that on Amazon? <laughs> I, <order> I, you... <laughs> I do, actually. It, <laughs> it, it arrived at the house out of nowhere. I thought, wow, anybody can do this. These packages are awesome. I like, don't think that's what it that's is. That's not the same. But there's, So there's the Order of Canada, and then there's the Order of Hockey in Canada, which is new. Tell us, just we're on it. We may as well. Well, it was pretty cool, and to especially be honoured uh, with Guy Lafleur and and Kim St. Pierre, uh, it was so special. Uh, sadly, uh, the Lafleur family was represented by his son because Guy sadly passed away. Uh, but it was such a cool event, and to be honored for what you have done in the game uh, was like. You never think of these things. You never think of the Hockey Hall of Fame. You never think of, uh, well, you always think of winning the Stanley Cup, but that's about it. You want to find a way to, uh, first of all, play, and you're fighting for ice time at the start, then you're fighting for ice time at the end, and then it's over. And I have been the luckiest guy to be able to uh, stay in the game at a distance, uh, uh, being chairman of the Hockey Hall of Fame. And if you love the game and love the history of the game, oh my gosh, it's so cool. I uh, I was lucky enough to work at the hall one summer and it was like to watch grown men come in and cry daily, <laughs> looking at the Stanley Cup, finding an uncle's name or the team they cheered for as a boy. It's a special place and your work with the hall, in the hall, it's it's that's pretty amazing. It all started on a farm outside of Hannah. How in the world could Dream So Big get nurtured there? You know, my dad, uh, my brother, older brother, which was probably the best thing that happened to me, uh, he would let me play with his friends uh, on two conditions. And we'd play on the outdoor rink at school. Uh, we went to the country school. It only went to grade eight. And then you went to uh, the big metropolis of Hannah. <laughs> Uh, there's a nickel backstory there, but yeah. uh, to be able to play with my older brother's friends, and he had two things. Uh, if there's any whining, you're out of the game, and if you can't keep up, you're out of the game. So it was probably the best thing that happened to me because you had to work harder and, and play harder uh, just to be with his friends, and he was four years older. So, uh, but growing up on the farm was so special, and uh, my dad, uh, he took over the family farm when he was uh, 15 years old. His dad died of a heart attack, and he was the oldest boy, so that's what he did. He had a grade 8 education, but that old guy was brilliant. And he, he did everything in the community. Uh, whatever happened, he was right in the middle of it. And that taught us so much about life and about helping other people and... And it was such a great way to grow up. And at the end of every day, regardless of how hard you work, dad would say, grab your baseball gloves or uh, grab your stick and we'll shoot pucks against the garage door, which 
had to be replaced about four times, but uh, Dad didn't care. He was he was out there having fun with the boys, and it was pretty cool. And the beauty of it is, my father grew up in the same sort of situation: outhouse, no running water. Yep. He said he used to set a glass of water beside his bed at night, and in the morning there'd be a crust of ice on it. There's no heat in the house or anything. But those guys. They did it all. They'd fix the garage, and then yep. they'd fix the tractor, and then they'd fix the, like they could. There was nothing they couldn't take on on their own. My my dad was known as the guy that could, if anything broke down, if he had a pair of pliers and some wire or binder twine, he could fix anything or get anything to run, uh, mechanically or or to build the uh, things. Uh, if someone's garage burnt down or that, he was right in the middle of it, making sure that. Uh, as a community, they built it back up, and what a great understanding and way to grow up and and uh, figure out kind of where you fit in. What were the expectations? I'm guessing like you grew up in a, in a small town. There's always that small town upbringing. I grew up in a small town. I didn't choose. I I always say to people, I couldn't choose friends. There was two other boys in my school. That's who you got to hang out with, right? There was. You didn't choose your clique or your friends. You made friends with who was there. What other values did you take that were kind of probably ingrained in you but were maybe pushed on you from your your, your old man and your family? Well, I think it was uh, probably more than anything work ethic and attitude and what you bring to the table. And, and I speak about uh, attitude and enthusiasm a lot to young people. Like uh, when you walk into a, a room... Like, have this big shit-ass smile on your face because the people on the other side are just like you. They're wondering, okay, who's coming through? And when you smile, you usually get a smile back in return, and that opens up a whole new conversation. And and mom and dad, uh, mom was a school teacher. Oh, she abused me something awful, and I'd complain to dad, and He'd say, you're badly abused, uh, and that was the end of it. <laughs> he was having no part of it. Uh, I will tell you a fun story. Uh, growing up, as we all do, we go out and party with our friends, and I think I was 14 or 15 at the time, always hanging out with older kids because that's who I played hockey with. And th we were at a party, uh, and... Uh, they dropped me off at the house, and it's about a quarter of a mile in, and I said, let, let me off right at the intersection. I'll walk in at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And so they, no, nope, they drive right into the yard. They're doing donuts oh, in the yard. No. Like, thanks a lot, guys. I get out. <laughs> Mom's at the door. Just lambaste me, and, and my brother, who... Uh, uh, Lynn was always the good guy. Uh, he's just, uh, it, we slept in the same room. He's looking at me like, you dumbass. <laughs> and the next day, we're, I'm out working with my dad, and he said, here's, here's the deal. Uh, and maybe you can help me out with this. He said, when mom gets mad at you, she takes it out on me. So if you can kind of pick your spots a little bit better, you and I'll have a great relationship. <laughs> and that was like, wow, that was a good life lesson right there. That's Boy, that resonates for a lot of people, I'm guessing. Um, <laughs> so you're hanging out with people way older than you're playing sports with them. You're obviously good. At what point, it's like, well, of course you're good for your age in this tiny little hamlet, but... Can you allow yourself to think about the big city? Like, what would it even have been like driving past Calgary at that age? Can you dream about the NHL at that point? Well, you always dream about it because Dad and, and Lynn and I always listened to the radio. We didn't have a TV. We actually had a TV when I turned 10 years old. But we were only allowed to watch two shows. Uh, and Hockey Night in Canada wasn't one of them. Hmm. Uh, one was uh, Ed uh, Sullivan. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one was Bonanza, because Dad loved, <laughs> loved Bonanza. <laughs> and so we would listen to uh, Foster Hewitt uh, and Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday night in the kitchen. And, like, it was so cool uh, growing up that way. And you, you, my dad was this huge Toronto Maple Leaf fan, and even though I got uh, uh, drafted 
to Cleveland, uh, the Crusaders, and and could have made way more money there. I I don't know if my dad would ever talk to me again <laughs> if I actually went there. And so to to grow up uh, listening to it and dreaming of maybe playing it uh, was so great. And I I got one of the luckiest breaks. The guy that I played hockey with, uh, George McRae. Uh, he was he was as good, if not uh, better, than I was. We played on the same team growing up. We had a great coach, Ron Howery, uh, for seven years. Every time we would move up, he would move up. And uh, he got uh, invited to go to the Lethbridge Sugar Kings uh, on a tryout. And his dad said, uh, well, he doesn't want to go alone. He asked uh, myself and my dad, why don't we take Lanny with you? And so we went together. And that was kind of the break I needed. And I got there. We both made the team. I picked up the phone, called uh, mom and said, mom, uh, good news. I made the team. I'm not coming home. And, <laughs> and mom went to the field and got dad. They were in Lethbridge in three and a half hours. <laughs> oh my goodness. Mom was a teacher. No, you're coming home. You're going to school. I said, Mom, I'm not coming home. This is what I want to do. And she said, Lauren, what do you think? And Dad, who, and I can't even imagine that uh, ride home. Dad said, well, if you're not coming home, I'm turning the, the calves back out on the milk cows because I'm not going to milk the five cows you milk <laughs> every day. And that was Dad's way of saying, yep, you can stay. Well, mom blew a gasket and thank goodness they left. And I was like, oh my gosh. How, how old were you then? 15. 15. Wow, that's young. Yeah. And two years there, two years in Medicine Hat. And they came to most of the games uh, and never stay. They would turn around and drive home because dad thought the farm would fall apart uh, yeah. if he was gone for 12 hours. Pretty cool. So the Sugar Kings were junior A at that point. Medicine Hat uh, was Western League. Uh, you're established as a very high-end prospect. And as you alluded to, it's a really unique window in pro hockey where there's the WHA and the NHL competing for players. And to your point, the way the WHA got, or the WHA got guys was to be able to pay more. And the yep. NHL was this old boys club that didn't want to pay well. So there you are, a top prospect with two leagues drafting you there was sort of a thought that you were going to go WHA, but then the Leafs draft you. Uh, and it couldn't have worked out better. I, have, I was actually at the draft. I think there was maybe five players at the draft and they, they were only at the draft because at that time the draft was always in Montreal and we played in the Memorial Cup. Uh, sadly lost the Memorial Cup. Uh, at that time there was only three teams and it was goals for and against. Okay. And we lost to, uh, we beat the Marlies, who won the Memorial Cup, 3-2, uh -huh. lost to Quebec 7-4. We never talked badly about the referees, but <laughs> they did not want the West in the final. Uh, and we played uh, uh, 15 minutes of the first period shorthanded. Come on. So, yep. We were down 5-1. Uh, we could lose by... Uh, two goals, but not by three, and we oh. lost by seven four, fighting to get back into it. And then the Memorial Cup uh, gets played between Quebec and Toronto Marlies, and the Marlies beat them ten nothing. And it was like one of those sad things. But we were at in Montreal, so we stayed for the draft. And I'll never forget because Quebec, no, sorry. Uh, Vancouver drafted third that year. So uh, Denny Potfin goes first. Uh, he was there. Tommy Lysiak, my center iceman, went second to Atlanta. Vancouver, I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to take a Westerner. And they take Dennis Ververgaard. And I'm all excited. Oh my gosh, this dream could come true for Dad and I. <laughs> and they draft me and King Clancy comes over to the wall 
and takes me over to the table and introduces me to everyone at the table. And it was so cool. And it, the, this room was jammed. Uh, were you nervous? Or, like, or, is, or was it just pure excitement? To, oh, like, it's is it just a... pure excitement. Yeah. Uh, I was nervous walking over to the table because these were people you, you oh, saw on television yeah. and uh, were, were talking about all the time. But it it was just uh, so good, and and to have that dream come true for six and a half years, even though I got traded, uh, you know what? Uh, I love Toronto, and to be able to go back now with the Hockey Hall of Fame, I know so many people, and it's fun hanging out. And we try and I try and make sure that when we have meetings, especially through the winter, I'll look at the. Maple Leaf schedule so that I can double up at night yeah. and go go see a hockey game and no, it's cool. Was there anyone from that day at the draft that you that you had really idolized and and that kind of took you under their wing and, and made you feel comfortable? Or was it a different world? Like I'm trying to envision like Brian yeah. Scrudland, he was yep. from Saskatoon when I got drafted. He was with Florida, he phoned me. Immediately, he's like, "Hi, Rhett. Yep. I'm Brian." It was I'm sure stuff like that happened, but I, I'm not even sure we had uh, either uh, cell phones. Certainly didn't have no, cell no. phones, and didn't have anyone's numbers. And uh, John McClellan, uh, who I, at that time was the the coach, and I think he might even have been the the GM. Uh, Jim Gregory uh, was there, and so he would call every so often to make sure uh, you were well prepared for uh, training camp. Uh, but uh, it, it was just the, the coolest time. When I finally got to training camp, the guy that took me under his wing was Ronnie Ellis. Uh, and he kept saying, like, this is what you got to do. He said, uh, I know you can take care of yourself. You probably have to fight six to eight times that first year uh, just so people understand you're willing to jump in the fray. And I'll never forget, we went to Philadelphia. I fight Schultz in the very first game, cool. just got hammered uh, by Schultz. I go to the penalty box. I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I did what Ronnie Ellis told me to. I get back to the bench and... Ronnie's looking at me like, what were you thinking? <laughs> and he, he, he like was exasperated. And I said, Ronnie, you told me to fight. Not Schultz, you dumbass. <laughs> like, pick your spots better. Oh, now I get it. Go for the top dog. Yeah, no, you, you should never do that. Village Honda is a proud supporter of Barnburner. You can find them in the Northwest Auto Mall or check them out online at villagehonda.com. Village Honda's got new Hondas arriving daily. Drive away in your new Honda from Village Honda, your dealership for life in the Northwest Auto Mall and at villagehonda.com. The Hearing Loss Clinic has been helping change people's lives for the better since 1993. At the Hearing Loss Clinic, it's never been about hearing impairment. It's been about empowering you to be socially active, more connected with those around you, and confident in every aspect of your life. People of any age can suffer from hearing loss, and studies have shown that serious health risks have been linked to untreated hearing loss. They have nine locations to serve you, four in the city of Calgary. Make a healthy choice and book an evaluation today at hearingloss.ca. Okay, so... Was Toronto just, uh, did it blow your mind or had you been traveling enough with junior hockey that going to a city of that size wasn't a big deal? You, you know, Montreal for the draft you'd alluded to. No, it was, it was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, like when you come from the farm and Hannah, which is probably, I think it, it at that time it was probably 2,500 people. It went to about 3,500 and now I think it's back to 2,500. Uh, and now you go to Toronto, and and at that time I think uh, three million plus wow. in the Toronto downtown and a little bit of the surrounding area. Now, my God, if you take in uh, all of it, Mississauga, and uh, it goes all the way to Hamilton. I'm sure it's probably eight to ten million. Uh, it was so big, and I was like a 
not a kid in a candy store. I, w- I was lost. I, I, uh, Ian Turnbull uh, and I both got drafted together. We, we ended up having apartments in the same complex, uh, straight up Young Street uh, at St. Clair because it was so easy to get back and forth no to turns. the rink. Just go down Young no Street. No turns. <laughs> Just go, go to Maple Leaf Gardens yeah. and there you were. And like... You didn't stray that far off of that whole area uh, because, my God, it was so big uh, at, at that time for a kid from uh, Hannah or Craig Mile, which was the official uh, uh, address for the farm. But I want to go back to junior. I hate going backwards, but I got to imagine that there's some stories in junior and playing junior hockey at that time was just, wild wild west or call it whatever you want but who were the the characters that you played junior with that maybe people might not recognize as much or or, or but stand out to you that were big junior hockey players that maybe never moved on well this guy did move on uh, i played uh, uh, in uh, lethbridge with john davidson oh. uh, and john davidson was our goalie he was also our best fighter <laughs> and and <laughs> Uh, John was this big, fun-loving guy. The parties were always at his place uh, where he boarded. And uh, uh, we laugh about it today because uh, John just retired as uh, chairman of the selection committee. uh, And he was on the selection committee himself uh, before that. Uh, he spent 24 years with us at the Hockey Hall of Fame, and we got in the, the taxi uh, heading for the airport. Uh, this is probably two years ago after the election uh, for the newest members. And we look at each other, and we both start laughing. Like, can you imagine? Here's two kids uh, from the Lethbridge Sugar Kings, yeah. uh, chairman of the hall and chairman of the selection committee, and, and we still chat all the time uh, he's been a great influence uh, on me uh, you, you go to medicine hat and you've got the gas off gang uh, and what a great way to play junior hockey because it could get tough when you played against swift current or you played against uh, regina with the uh, clark gillies uh, there's a story fought him four times that they were not good. Um, oh, for four? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a common theme here. Um, but uh, no, it it was uh, it, everywhere you played, you had these characters. Uh, the gas off uh, boys, we had Jim McCrimmon, who I believe was the last cut from the, the Edmonton Eskimos. Uh, he played football uh, as well. And so you put gas off on one side and McCrimmon on the other side, uh, and that was our penalty killing. And guys didn't want to go down the boards. Uh, they'd get <laughs> whacked, hacked, two-handed. And Lysiak and I killed all the penalties, but we, we never shot the puck down. Uh, like, we're, yeah. on the, uh, we're on the offense uh, start to finish. Uh, we always ended up in different... Uh, situations and Jim McCrimmon and he was a mountain of a man uh, at, at, to me at that time because he was probably 6'3 about 230 yeah. um, and uh, when we played the Edmonton uh, Oil Kings uh, that was the junior team uh, they always liked to, to uh, kind of ease over onto our side and warm up And Jim and Bob would always say, guys, like, get your ass back over on that side, uh, your side of the ice. And they wouldn't listen. So Jim told us before we went out for warm-up, if this happens again, get ready, boys, because I'm going to shoot on their goalie. (laughs) And sure enough, (laughs) they wouldn't listen. Jim takes, uh, he, he tells us, all right, here we go. And he goes straight up the middle of the ice in between their two lines in on their goalie, takes a slap shot. Well, <laughs> yeah. we're all, the refs had to come out with running shoes on. A uh, whole bunch of people got suspended. Oh, my God. it was That was junior hockey at its finest. 
What about your first NHL game? I remember mine. Oh, and my You're nervous God. as hell, and you got the jitters. Can you give us some? <laughs> well, it, it was good and bad there uh, as well. I, I'm playing with Davey Keon and Dennis Duperry. And uh, Davey was one of my heroes growing up as, as a kid. And this is so cool. I assist on both. Uh, we're playing Buffalo. I assist on both of Davey's uh, goals. I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, I'm going to be one of the stars. Like, I'm sitting there in the third period, and Red Kelly taps me on the shoulder and says, uh, you're out on the power play. I had no idea why I was on the power play, but I already got two assists in the game. Like, let's go with it. I get out there, and I grab the puck back in our end. I'm steaming up the left wing, and... I think it was, I'm not even sure, it was either uh, Jerry Korab or Richard Martin, one or the other, stepped out of the penalty box, go to throw a Rick hip, Martin. Check, hip check at me. Rick Martin, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. sorry, I, I read this last night, so I, I thought yeah. I'd help you with the name. Uh, and I think, oh, shit, I got two assists in the game, I'll just jump up over the top of him. <laughs> Wasn't wearing a helmet in my very first game. And... I go ass over tea kettle, land on my head. I got eight stitches here, another uh, six in the back of my head. And I remember laying there in a pool of blood and Joe Scrow, the trainer, gets to me and, and he said, uh, like, you know where you are? He, oh, yeah, yeah, I already got two assists in the game. I'm fine. And he knew right then, like, totally kookaloo. They <laughs> they take me into the training room uh, and they have a look at me obviously i got a concussion and they send me to the wellesley hospital and i couldn't believe how incompetent the nurses and doctors were obviously they weren't watching the game they wake you up every half hour what's your name what do you do for a living come on guys i already got two assists in the game and uh, that was my very first game uh so here you, you think you're thinking you're going to be a star and you end up in the hospital, <laughs> didn't play for the next three games and uh, put my helmet back on and uh, the rest was history. Uh, 1,110 more games uh, with a helmet on and thank God it happened in the first one. What was the dynamic in Toronto? Because we talked about it. You come in and you're actually making pretty good money as a rookie, which had, wouldn't have happened to a lot of your teammates because the WHA wasn't there. It's a huge market. I'm sure there's some big egos amongst the stars. Like, did you have to win them over? Because it was, it was a sort of a slow build to you becoming a 40 goal guy. Well, it really was. And uh, Normie Allman and 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 Ronnie Ellis uh, were always really good to me but uh, people like uh, Davy Keon and and some of the older defensemen uh, uh, didn't take kindly to it and you had to earn your stripes and that first year when I was struggling to find my way and here they pay you a lot of money and and you're supposed to score 25 30 goals in that first year and I got 12 and so that that was kind of a, a real setback. Uh, but even the next year, I only got 14, but added way more assists. And then uh, year three, and it really, when you think about everyone's career, the kids today are so much different because they've had world juniors, uh, under 17, under 18 world juniors. World-class training world-class training and they just step in our world-class training was have fun the whole summer and get in shape in uh, or a week before training camp and that's obviously not the way it is today but that's the way it was back then uh, there's even a letter that i i got way back uh, whenever to uh, make sure uh, when you come to training camp you bring your golf clubs and hopefully you've had a good summer <laughs> Oh, bring your golf clubs. Oh, well, I didn't even own golf clubs at that time. You gotta just take yeah. up a new sport. Yeah. Did you ever? You say you got twelve goals your first year. It's you're in Toronto. It's it's big time. Did you ever question yourself? Uh, all the time. Uh, like, 
you, you knew you had it, but you just couldn't bring it out. And one of the keys was after, at the end of the first year, I went back to Medicine Hat. Uh, we ran a hockey school there. Um, and Luke Lashinsky, the old trainer for the Medicine Hat Tigers said, let me see your skates. You're falling down way too, uh, too often. I'd get knocked off my feet and, and he said, oh my gosh, you're a river skater and these, these have massive rockers in your skates. He said, when you go back, tell the trainers, do not put any rocker in your skate because you're not, you're not a turn and, and dipsy doodle guy. You're a straight forward kind of guy. And it was like a game changer. And even though I only scored uh, the 14 the next year, I could feel the confidence coming. And probably the best thing was Red Kelly, the coach, and uh, Jim Gregory, the general manager. And Jim would take me aside to uh, have a cup of coffee, and he would say, if it ever gets too much for you, he said, we will trade you to where you want to go. But he said, we're not going to trade you. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like that is – you wouldn't be told that uh, today. Yeah. And Red Kelly and Andra Kelly, uh, we didn't live that far from them. And uh, they would invite me over for dinner as a, as a rookie. I didn't know you weren't supposed to go to the coach's <laughs> uh, place. And like he, he made me feel so comfortable that it became easy to play the game uh, after that. And so I had all kinds of help. And then in year three, got married to Ardell. Uh, and when you have someone to share it with, uh, you, uh, you have that person that can kick you in the butt or uh, pat you on the back and say it's okay. And away we went. 37 goals a year after that, it all clicked. And all of a sudden, it's like this high pick for the Leafs has arrived. It would have been amazing uh, just – you would have become a star, not that you wouldn't have been recognizable, but now it's a guy that's flirting with 40 in his third year. Well, and from there, uh, at the end of that year, in the middle of the summer, I got called uh, to go to Team Canada. And you go to Team Canada, and I think that that team uh, ended up, of the 23 guys, 19 were Hall of Famers. Jeez. And I'm like a you talk about a kid in the candy store. I'm looking around and there's Esposito, Bobby Hull, uh, Bobby Clark, Reggie Leach. Like the list just went on and on. And the defense, uh, like the big three out of, uh, out of Montreal, Denny Potvin, Bobby Orr. Uh, and to make that team and then uh, play in it and then be able to be lucky enough to assist uh, on Daryl's winning goal – that gave you so much confidence from there. And then the next year, I think I went three years in a row, 40 plus goals. And then all of a sudden got traded to Colorado. <laughs> McLeod Law is proud of their Calgary roots. It's a big part of their longstanding client relationships. They understand the city, people in it, and the way things work in Calgary. Like the communities they serve, the McLeod Law team, varied, diverse, and share a commitment to making a positive impact in Calgary. Whether your challenge is business or personal, they're in it with you, professionals with a common goal, helping clients meet their goals. McLeod Law. Bonton Meat Market. You've heard us talk about Bonton for years, and if you know, you know. And if you don't, then what's taking so long? Bonton Meat Market has been serving Calgary for over a hundred years and is better than ever. When you walk through the door, you can take comfort in knowing that the product is the very best. Quality and the customer is number one to Greg Keller and his staff at Bonton. Once again, voted Calgary Consumer Choice Award winner for the best deli meat market. Summer is here. It's time for Bonton. Bonton Meat Market, 28 Crowfoot Circle Northwest. Coaches, you mentioned Red Kelly and the other guys. That, we got to imagine there were some characters coaching in junior hockey too. How much influence did they have on you? Was the interactions, would you th be the same as they are in today's world? Or I feel like there's a defined line where coaches are here, players are here. There's not an intermingling. You're going to the coach's house for 
for suppers, which is, <laughs> I think, great. It should be more like that. But I, again, there had to be junior coaches that were co characters. There had to be coaches in the NHL that were characters. And how much coaching did they do? Well, uh, going all the way back to Lesbridge, John Chapman probably taught me more. And he's been a scout uh, for 30 plus years after he finished uh, coaching. And uh, he taught me what it would take to be a good player. Uh, and you, you got to play tough. You got to uh, answer the bell. You got to be a good uh, leader. Uh, you got to stick up for your teammates. And all of that helped me along the way. Then you go to Medicine Hat and Jack Shoup, uh, who was more of a, uh, he had about uh, 20 ways to say, Jesus Christ, guys. <laughs> and it was, Jesus, or, oh, golly. And, and it, like, total character. And then you go and you have Red Kelly, who was more like a father figure and took me under his wing. And then Roger Nielsen comes along. And Roger was so much ahead of his time. And you talk about a cat and mouse game when uh, when Scotty uh, Bowman coached against Roger. And, and Daryl would get so frustrated because Roger was always trying to match lines and Daryl would finally turn around and say, Roger, just let us play, come on. And, but it, that's, that's how it, those coaches were. And, and they were a step ahead of all the other coaches. Uh, and then I go to, uh, uh, well, let me finish off in Toronto, uh, Floyd Smith and Punch Imlac. Uh, that was not uh, the way to actually uh, uh, play in the NHL. Uh, so enough of that. You go to Colorado and you have Don Cherry, and and Don was awesome. He was he was never an X and O or a great coach. He was a great motivator, yeah. and guys would go through the wall for him. And then you get traded to uh, Calgary, and you have uh, L McNeil, who I love to this day, and uh, the knowledge uh, and the understanding of the game that he had. And yet then uh, a second Roger Nielsen comes along in Bob uh, Johnson. So I've had some of the greatest coaches. And even when we end up winning the cup, and I always felt badly for Bob when we didn't win the cup uh, with him here because he was such a large part of it. And Terry Chris comes in and finishes it off. So I've been really lucky. Uh, and you talk about a mix across the board. Yeah. Uh, it was so much fun. Well, there's some Hall of Famers in there too. That's, that's wild. Like big, big name coaches. Uh, coming back to Southern Alberta would have felt like, like a homecoming of sorts. Cause you play junior in Lethbridge and Medicine Hat. You grow up in Hannah, you, you become this hockey star, and then somehow, some way, you end up in Calgary, Alberta. And I was worried. I, I thought, oh my gosh, it's so close to home, and uh, will they actually uh, accept it? Because I got traded for two very popular guys, uh, both in the city, but also in the dressing room. Uh, when you get traded for Donnie Lever and... and uh, Bobby McMillan, uh, that's tough. And, but coming back, people uh, people always made you feel like, oh my gosh, he's he, this long lost son has come home. And they made me feel great, like right out off the bat. I, I'll never forget, I had a separated shoulder when I got here. I came back early because I think we'd lost nine games in a row or something. And I'm sitting in the whirlpool and Poplinski comes in and he said, oh my gosh, we got damaged goods. Like, <laughs> what a bad trade. And then I reminded him, oh, there was a fourth round draft pick that came with it. <laughs> it's not just me. <laughs> his, his name was Bill Clavider. I'll never forget it. Who never, ever played a game, but at least he was a part of the trade. <laughs> But, it out. but it were, apparently you were greeted with an incredible reception and all those concerns were probably quelled pretty early. Uh, they were. And, and even, uh, even 
uh, in the dressing room knowing that you were playing injured. Uh, and I don't think I scored till the seventh game uh, that year, uh, but ended up with 35 in that last half of that year. Wow. And it, uh, all those kind of worries kind of went away. Uh, but it was it was it was tough when you know you can't play at the best of your ability because of the shoulder injury. Um, but slowly but surely, uh, I turned it around. And Cliff Fletcher, uh, I love the guy. Uh, I'll never forget uh, the trade. And it's interesting when when. Uh, the team got uh, transferred from Atlanta to Calgary. And I knew Cliff just enough to say hello. And I was playing in Colorado at that time. I called Cliff and I said, Cliff, I know you're under the gun. You know that I'm from Alberta. Is there any possible way I could buy six season tickets in the old Corral? Because my father uh, and mom would come in, my mother-in-law, and they would come up from Medicine Hat, and they had great friends uh, that would come all the time. And Cliff got me six tickets. That was a year and three months before I ever got traded here. So I don't know if he was, he was foreshadowing all the way back then, but Man, it couldn't have turned out better. Apparently tried to add you in Atlanta as well before they moved. Well, he did. And that was part of the reason why Jim Gregory came to me on numerous occasions because Cliff was trying to put me back uh, with Tommy Lysiak, my center iceman from junior. And um, I, I just wanted to do it on my own and to be able to... Uh, got it out and then have such a great friendship and career uh, with Daryl Sittler. And we still chat probably two times, if not three times a week. We talk about uh, kids and grandkids now instead of goals and assists. <laughs> uh, and that's so much fun. And we do lots of different charity events together. And it's, it's like every time you get together, it's like you never left. And yeah, still best friends today. I've got one last hockey one because there's so much of your life that is, is incredible that happened after you stopped playing, which, you know, I, I don't want to say is uncommon, but I almost feel like you've got notoriety amongst people that never even saw you play because of how significant your, uh, you know, things outside of hockey have been in your life. Uh, you score 66 goals that next year in Calgary. We talked about you were hurt. You wanted to show you how good you were. The next year, was that your best year? And, and where was that team as you guys sort of ran up against that Oilers dynasty and finally the crescendo of winning in 89? Uh, you know, that was such a special year. Uh, every time you touched the puck, you believed you were going to score. And Guy Schwenard was probably as good as Daryl was. Uh, Daryl was more, uh, he could do it all. He could fight. He could, he could throw uh, big checks. Uh, uh, he was a great leader. Guy was a quiet, uh, confident uh, guy that uh, it laughed at himself all the time because he'd go to Philadelphia and he'd get like three assists. And, and Guy was, was not the bravest guy, especially going in the corners. And they'd ask him, like, Guy, how'd you do it? And he'd say, oh, if you were as afraid of me as I was of them, uh, like... You'd skate fast too, and and that that's that was so much fun at that time. Played the first half of the year with Eddie Beers on left wing. Played the second half with Dougie Riseboro because Eddie got hurt, and it was a magical year. Uh, but Bob Johnson and Cliff were working all that time, trying to figure out a way to. Uh, play hard enough to, to be able to compete with the Oilers because they knew if we could beat the Oilers, we had a chance to win the Stanley Cup. And you think all through those years, uh, Montreal, uh, uh, Edmonton, and ourselves were kind of three of the best. And if you could get through the, the Oilers, 
then you had a great chance and we we finally do it in 86 and and lose to Montreal in the final and boy things happen for a reason and you get a a chance to do it again in 89 and by the way we thought in 86 like we we're that good we we're going right back in 87 right back in 88 and it takes you three years to get back there again and we knew if we didn't win it was over and and you think of uh el mcginnis winning uh con Smythe that year uh, mike vernon could have won the con Smythe on the first round alone game seven game seven uh in overtime two one-timers tony tanti and patrick Squico and stan smeal on the breakaway and he stops all three and we find a way to win it and then the rest is history you you become the only team to ever win on the farm ice uh and then the cup trip home uh because uh el marie came to pep and i <clears throat> and timmy hunter and said i can cut the locks off uh the stanley cup which is in in the bottom of the of the plane and we said oh my god go for it and we were on an air canada flight where there was a back door and you could come up the back stairs so we put it in the we shielded him he got it up the back stairs put it in the bathroom put a, a, a out of order yeah. on the bathroom we're up in the air 20 25 minutes and the captain comes on congratulates uh, everyone on winning the stanley cup and he said by the way we have a special guest on board if you turn around and look at the back and el murray comes out of the washroom with the stanley cup well the party was on <laughs> from from there we tried to get cliff to stop in winnipeg for more booze because we had run out of booze by the time we got to winnipeg and and he said guys winnipeg closes up at nine o'clock <laughs> it's it no like <laughs> we have no chance so i think we landed at five o'clock in the morning or whatever and there was like twenty thousand people at the airport it was crazy what was the room like in montreal like was there lots of family that had traveled or was it just the guys right like you went on the road and it's a different yep. world now i got to imagine teams fly family and friends in now back then it was it a smaller group and you just kind of shared it together it, it was a smaller group i think there was three wives and two uh significant others uh, uh i'm not even sure if they were engaged yeah. uh but uh as soon as we won cliff said make sure like we're all going home together so uh you had the everyone that was important he had taken quite a bit of the staff uh to montreal uh with us so the wives the girlfriends uh, that were there uh and all the owners and there's a great picture of i think five of the six owners that were there at that time uh on the plane with the stanley cup all huddled together and that ownership taught our alumni so much about giving back to the community and we're still trying to do it today what about some of the old rinks are there rinks that you liked going into some that were just horrific and terrible like people always ask me what was your favorite rink to play in i loved going into the old spectrum in philly because they hated you philly <laughs> fans hated you they wanted you to be hurt and injured and and i loved beating them you didn't well, always do it you also came into the league when you were just losing some of those great yeah, buildings like Montreal, maple leaf gardens and yep. you know boston gardens the chicago stadium is supposed to be insane uh, i i think i was the luckiest guy i played in all six original buildings wow and uh, you talk about uh chicago and they were probably one of the greatest fights i've ever seen in chicago was in the stands <laughs> where where uh in the middle of the game this fight breaks out and the whole lower bowl was chairs like they weren't attached to the floor yeah. and people were beating each other over the head with chairs <laughs> one whole section was in a fight and the cops because it was a bad area the cops came out of nowhere uh, and they turn off all the lights in the building that's the only way they broke up the fight 
so you you play in Chicago and and like it was like a gladiator pit and and that organ was unbelievable. You go to Detroit uh, and the Olympia, like you could you visited with the people because there was no real boxes. Uh, in behind, you could share popcorn with the guy right <laughs> oh behind you. Um, and Boston Gardens with those tiny corners uh, and people yelling and screaming at you. And like it just went on and on. And to be able to, like I said before, win in Montreal uh, and Maple Leaf Gardens, like still today, um, we've been back for numerous different charity events uh, there. Uh, and thank goodness they at least found a way to keep a rink uh, upstairs and, and the globe or the bowl uh, uh, up top. It, it makes you still feel a little bit like it's uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. It, it was just the greatest. And then you go into uh, New York and, and the circus had been there the night before and it's like, oh my God, uh, nothing could smell worse than, than that. Uh, but it was it was the best of times, and sadly, because all the new rinks go so far out and back, uh, you lose that intimacy. And I think that's why I loved the Corral. Yeah, uh, you, you played junior there, you played pro there, and I know it certainly helped me uh, 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 end up scoring as many goals as I did. Uh, that one year and so it was fun so you noted that the ownership group taught you about giving back to the community it's something that you as you noted a lot of that 89 team has taken to to heart seriously you're a huge part of the flames alumni you now have the 04 group that's in there as well as some other guys trickling in along the way people from other organizations but tell us about the, some of the initiatives you're proud about or at least what's front burner right now for you because this is the time of year where everyone does have their big charitable events. It's not minus 20 outside and people are excited to get out and do stuff. Well, when you think about uh, donating as much money as we have through the alumni, uh, the difference we've made with CP kids, uh, special Olympics, uh, Ronald McDonald house, children's hospital, the list just goes on and on. And to have nine guys from the Stanley cup team, live in the city that's that's unheard of uh i think in any city uh yes uh toronto has way bigger numbers than we do but to have made our alumni when we first started it because we didn't have very many guys we made ours the calgary flames nhl alumni so that a guy like mike rogers uh, or or a guy like Lindsey Carson wouldn't get back to Philadelphia or Mike wouldn't get back to New York or Hartford. They can be a part of ours. And those guys have made our alumni so much stronger. And yeah, it has been so much fun to uh, be a part of it. Dana Merzen ran the, the golf tournament. We, we turned probably $150,000 a year right back into the community. Uh, we do uh, the brown bagging box lunches for, for the kids. And you talk about trying to make a difference. I think there, the brown bagging now is involved in 320 uh, schools, 6,000 kids a day. Wow. That if we, and we donate 20 to $30,000 through the alumni a year back to brown bagging, if we weren't a part of it, uh, we would never have known like there was such a need. And to be able to help uh, change that or or be a part of making sure kids are, are fed. And if you're hungry, chances are you're not going to learn uh, very well or very much. And we gave them a chance. So you feel good. Vina Nova is Calgary's lab-grown diamond specialist. They're the only store in Calgary that specializes exclusively in lab-grown diamonds. You know you're getting the largest selection of loose lab-grown diamonds and jewelry in the entire city. Savings from lab-grown diamonds can be as much as 80% off. Visit vinanova.com or check them out in their downtown showroom on the second level 
of Stephen Avenue Place. What is a lab-grown diamond? Well, lab-grown diamond, simply a diamond that's been grown in a lab. They have the same chemical composition and crystal structure as natural earth mined diamonds due to its identical nature. Lab created diamonds have the same hardness, right? Refraction and pretty much the same as a natural diamond. Only difference, they're lab created and referred to as synthetic because they are chemically and physically the same, but are man-made. Be confident knowing you can save up to 80% compared to mine diamonds pretty much across the board. You want a custom design done? Vina Nova can do that as well. Just give them a few weeks of heads up to complete your custom piece. Find out more at vinanova.com. There's a great study out there that actually says that the, one of the best ways to change the world is to feed the people that are hungry. Because if you're hungry, you're not thinking about anything else. You're no, not survival mode. You're not, yeah. it's, uh, it's the most, I forget how they termed it, but it's like the most cost-effective way of, of changing people's lives and, and, and improving society. So the, the alumni does a lot of that stuff. You've sort of handed the reins off the the uh, eighty nine group to a couple of the younger guys. There's a couple of four guys for the golf tournament. That's one of your major events with the alumni. Uh, can you talk about? I don't want to say passing as a torch because that indicates you guys are done and you're still very involved. But just watching this next generation, that 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 second great team that got all the way to the final. Well, you you think about uh, uh, guys like uh, Curtis Glencross, uh, uh, Robin Regeer. Chris Kalanis, uh, uh, Mason Raymond, the guy sitting right across from us who started the, uh, the hockey uh, uh, school here. It, it, in, then you add in Mike Commodore and, and like I said, uh, Rob McGear, who took over the, the golf tournament after Dana uh, Pep started it or was a big part of it to start with. He handed it over to... Uh, Dana, who ran it for about 25 years, and now Robin and uh, Mike Commodore are doing it, and uh, they're tweaking a few things, making it uh, uh, even better than it was uh, before, uh, and we love it. Th to, to see that next generation uh, so proud of uh, helping make a difference, and I think we have around 50 actual uh, Calgary Flames live in or just outside of the city and another just about a hundred that played in the NHL so we basically have 150 guys to call on at any time and it's been wonderful so that's the the alumni but you're also involved in a ton of stuff outside of the alumni I remember we had uh, Lanny in studio like five years ago oh, what have you been up to Lanny's like well I was just in none of it with Scotiabank and I'm like oh my god you're ever you're just in Toronto you're also a really active grandfather now you've got a brewery that you own a part of in Montana I mean there, there's a lot of post talky Lanny that's fascinating to a lot of people well I just got back before I went to Toronto I got back from Nottingham England uh, the the tier one or uh, number one division uh, for the IHF was going on and they asked if I would come and speak at the gala event and so Phil Pritchard came with me. Okay. We took the cup to Nottingham, England. Obviously, uh, you didn't think it was a big deal, but it was a big deal. People lined up from nine o'clock in the morning. We opened at 10. There was an hour and a half wait all day long until the game that night at seven. Uh, and uh, the UK was playing against Italy, had to win the game to make it up to the world championships for next year and won the game in a barn burner. <laughs> uh, uh, and like 8,000 people jammed in a 7,500 seat arena, like chanting from start to finish. They had experienced the cup all day long. Uh, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic trip. I get home. Uh, go right back to Toronto. Uh, we've had uh, great meetings on Monday and Tuesday. I get to hang out with the grandkids. That's this the Hall of Fame, just to... Hall of Fame, yep. yep. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, uh, probably three months ago, uh, I got asked to come back on board. I was uh, uh, chairman of the fundraising for the Ronald McDonald House 40 years ago. Uh, my dear wow. wife, Ardell, and I... 
and they asked if I would come back and help them out again. They're expanding from 20, no, 30 rooms to 90 rooms. Wow. And they're doing the same thing in Edmonton. So I contacted Kevin Lowe to see if he would be my counterpart up there, and he graciously accepted. And we're having the groundbreaking on June 14th for the expansion of the Ronald McDonald House. I couldn't be prouder after 40 years to uh, help make a, a difference uh, again. And uh, they have put, if you can imagine, 40,000 families in 40 years through the Ronald McDonald House. And they're only, uh, they're only, uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, so their mission? Requirement. No, they're they're only taking care of fourteen percent of the actual need. Oh, so the so they're the, doing everything it can, and it's amazing how many they've put through. But clearly, yeah. there's so the expansion was crucial. Yeah, and uh, so we're trying to help make a difference. Uh, Peter Allen, who's on our mm -hmm. our uh, 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 board alumni board, uh, has jumped in and he's helping me with the oil and gas people. Uh, it's amazing how uh, you talk about family or teammates. Uh, teammates come together, and you uh, you can't do it alone. But with the good people around you, and our alumni is good people, uh, you make a difference, and that's where we're at. And I love every day. Do you get some downtime, or is it grandpa oh. at the lake time, or what is it? Oh yeah, it's grandpa at the lake time. Uh, we had uh, we have eight grandkids, six boys, two girls. Thank goodness the last one, uh, uh, Olive, uh, Olive, who is only eight months old, is a thing of beauty, and my dear wife was so happy. Okay, now I can spoil two girls, because uh, the boys are all, they're all in boys, let me, let me tell you, as Rhett knows all about boys. Uh, and it's so much fun. Amazing. Um, what are, are you in Montana a bunch? Cause that's kind of become your second home in a way, hasn't it? Well, it really has, uh, over the summer, uh, I have to come back for different events, uh, from time to time, but over the summer, we try and regroup as a family. Uh, uh, lots of times, uh, we only have two grandkids here in Calgary. Uh, but, uh, the two grandkids that are here, they'll come down, they'll stay with us for a month. Wow. So we we have all kinds of fun there, and they love their cousins, and and we get to regroup as a, as a family. Uh, we have the family uh, brewery down there. I'm on quality control, best job I've ever. <laughs> Are had. you hiring? I've heard about. This. No, you're, you're like four hundred in line. Uh, sorry, sorry to let you know where your standing is. That's all right. That's honest. <laughs> but I'm not giving that job up for a while. <laughs> What about the kids? They're involved in all kinds of stuff. The grandkids are running around. Are they focused on anything, or are they just playing all the different sports? Or Well, they, they are. Uh, we have uh, anywhere from 19, 17, 11, 10, 9, 8, all the 6, way. Yeah. 8 months. Uh, uh, Calder, our oldest, uh, he was heavily involved in hockey. Uh, he gave up hockey uh, a year ago, uh, got into skiing uh, big time. Uh, he just uh, tore his ACL, MCL, oh. uh, and had surgery. Uh, and so he's on eight-month rehab. Uh, our second is into uh, golf. Uh, there's probably three of the kids all into golf. Yep. Uh some play soccer. I picked up the two grandkids uh, from uh, the Y yesterday. Uh, the ones that are here, six and nine. One plays basketball. The other uh, swims. Uh, it. Do you treat the grandkids differently than the kids? When you're raising oh. kids, is it, it's a different. Oh, it, it, like the grandkids are so much uh, fun. And at the end of the day, you get to hand them back to mom and dad. That's right. Yeah. And like, I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, and, but yeah, you do treat them uh, differently. 
Uh, it's up to mom and dad to put the discipline in. Grandpa has to jump in and put the discipline in from time to time, but it's more uh, just having fun with them and enjoying uh, life. Uh, uh, Evan, I pick him up from school yesterday, and he said, oh, Grandpa, I'm so glad it's you. <laughs> he said, we have so much fun together. Well, that just melts your heart. Yeah. Like, talk about making your day. Yeah. Unreal. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, I wonder where you're at because you seem to have this, you know, inexhaustible supply of energy. You're on the go. You just talked about, you know, you you were in Toronto. You're back. You're off in a couple hours here. Uh, do you envision the next sort of five to ten years is taking on more huge projects or finding a way to wind things down and spend more time with family? Because uh, I mean, it seems like anything you set your mind on like hall of fame work or brewery, you know, you were in uh, ma the management side of hockey you were in the marketing side for the flames forever. Like how keen are you on taking on new projects versus that balance of family right now? Uh, you, you know what, uh, with the hockey hall of fame, uh, you have two five year terms as chairman. I'm already, uh, just about finished year seven. Okay. So really I look at it. I've got three years left there and I have loved it. Uh, I do a lot with Scotiabank and their hockey programs across the country. I try and do probably at least 20 events a year with the Calgary Flames, their charity events, their, their business uh, trips, uh, that sort of thing. And it's been a lot of fun. I think I would drive Ardell off the deep end if I was there all the time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and she knows, and our kids and grandkids uh, all understand that uh, what I do, uh, we've had our kids, uh, when I would go to the children's hospital as a player, I took my kids with me all the time at Christmas time to hand out gifts to the kids because that teaches them kind of what is important to us as a family. So that part will probably never change, but I also look forward to the day of being able to just to hang out and play a little, little more golf. Although my golf game's going the wrong way, but that's a whole. You just need story. more quality control before you tee off. Maybe <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I feel like Montana's going to solve a lot of these problems. <laughs> well, thank goodness. Uh, speaking of Montana, the kids, uh, our oldest uh, daughter Andra and her husband Josh, uh, they run the business and they are great at it. And uh, I. I get to visit with all the people and hang out and have fun. Uh, so we've got a great mix right now and hopefully that never changes. I got one last one for me, uh, just in gen your, your thoughts on the game. Uh, for me, the kids are so talented nowadays. Uh, it seems like leads don't matter anymore. And there was an era where if you were up by one or two, it kind of, they closed the door on you. What are your thoughts just in general on hockey right now and the skill and the way, where it's headed? Well, you, you look, you talked about the skill, but you look at the young players coming into the game and the notoriety right now that's going on with the, uh, the young man out of Regina and Bedard. Bedard. Uh, and, and the difference a guy like him, a generational guy can make for a franchise, you look at, at Connor and and Leon uh, up north, and and the excitement in in the the game because of it. You you look at some of the great young stars like Eichel in in Vegas and and the the gifts that they had have uh, from a pure talent standpoint, or a Jason Robertson uh, in Dallas. Uh, oh my gosh, the game is in a great place other than Arizona. Um, <laughs> but the game is in such a great uh, place right now. And, and who would ever guessed, uh, I don't think any uh, person's bracket is still <laughs> yeah, alive right. yeah. in the NHL. <laughs> and who would ever guess these are the final four teams uh, playing. Uh, but I love if I'm in town, I go to the games. Uh, I'm a hockey fan. Uh, 
and to see the great young players uh, today, but I still have my old favorites like Sidney Crosby and Jonathan Taves who play the game regardless of who they play with, they make the people around them better. And that is so cool. Betway, bet of the daytime. We're going back to NFL futures, and I'm looking at the wide receiver position. Well, it's tight end, too. Who's going to lead the league in receiving yards? I mean, who did it last year? It was Justin Bleepin Jefferson. He was unbelievable. Led the league in receptions, yardage, catches over 20 yards. I like him to do it again, not because it's like, ooh, what a stunning hot take, but there's kind of some value there. Plus 650. Tell me, six and a half to one? Justin Jefferson, the man, can't do it again? I'm not buying it. I think he can. Let's go get it. It's your Betway Bet of the Day. Lanny, it's been really awesome sharing this time with you. Have a great summer. We look forward to doing this again. I feel like we could uh, we could make it a 10-hour show. If you weren't so damn busy, we'd keep you here forever. <laughs> but I, I, we'll, we'll free you for now, but we might, we might call you back uh, to do it again. Thanks so much for sharing some time with us. As someone that grew up in this city, I mean, it's, it's an incredible incredible to see the impact you've made on the city and even beyond you talk about the province the country with the work you've done uh thanks for sharing some time with us it was a pleasure uh wish you guys nothing but success and uh, uh look forward to whenever you make the call i'll be back